Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming down. Um, I realize that uh, I'm between you and beer, so for my sakes and yours, I hope to keep this short. Uh, also, I know that there's, uh, you know, you're all here to see the really sexy metadata discussion instead of the boring AR, VR stuff in the other, other room right now. Um, so I'm talking about this, uh, migrating quake studies to Islandora. Is there anybody here who's, who's worked with Islandora before? Okay, one, <laughs> and, <laughs> okay, uh, so this is a, a project that I've been working on for most of the past year. Uh, I'll talk about what is Quake Studies, what is the Islandora platform, I'll talk about the migration process that we went through, uh, and talk about the future of Quake Studies and Islandora as well. Uh, so I'm Jonathan Hunt, I'm from Catalyst IT, uh, we're a large uh, IT organisation working with open source in New Zealand, Australia and UK and uh, we've got a big Drupal team. One of the interesting things is that Islandora is not just Drupal and I'll talk about that in a moment. So what is Quake Studies? Um, that's my old workplace in Christchurch uh, after the September 2010 earthquake and then the Boxing Day um, aftershock and then the 22 February earthquake. So there were some major quakes. Uh, in my hometown of uh, Christchurch and 185 people died. Uh, the CBD was extensively damaged. Uh, a lot of people wondered what they could do and the response at the University of Canterbury uh, Digital Humanities Department was to start an archive of all of the digital content arising from the earthquake. Uh, and Quake Studies is the largest node in the seismic uh, <coughs> network. So you see seismic is the Canterbury Earthquakes Digital Archive, and Quake Studies is the largest individual node within that. It's currently got around 153,000 objects uh, and, a, and about 1,800 collections. And these, these are digital objects, so they're, they're photographs, they're uh, newspaper pages, blog posts that are in PDF form, uh, PDF articles, uh, books, uh, lots of video, especially TV coverage, uh, news coverage, audio, a lot of interviews, a lot of oral histories about um, how people, what people's experience was during the earthquake, how they reacted, what the impacts were on them, how they, they got through the recovery. Uh, there's transcripts of some of those interviews. There's even 3D panoramas. Uh, and these are all in a whole variety of bi binary formats. So we're talking PDF, lots of MP4, MP3, text, zip files, and so on. And it doesn't scale very well, but it's a snapshot of the current homepage. And um, one of the things was this was put together fairly quickly, uh, and it didn't end up with a responsive design. It was built by a company called Learning Media. Um, and they got a lot of things right, uh, but as a company, they went out of business a few years later. So University of Canterbury came to Catalyst, and we've been supporting this instance up until now. But now we're migrating to Island Dora. So what is Islandora? It was started uh, from, uh, it's a digital research repository, uh, sorry, digital object repository. Uh, started in 2006 by the University of Prince Edward Island Robertson Library in Canada. Uh, and it's a Drupal front end for Fedora. So Fedora is a Java app and it stands for Flexible Extensible Digital Object Repository Architecture. And one of the interesting facts sidebars here is that Fedora predates the operating system by Red Hat by a long way and in fact Red Hat had to get permission from Fedora to use the name. Um, so Fedora itself is, is essentially just an API, it doesn't really have an administrative front end, it's just an API, it stores digital objects and the metadata and so there are a couple of front ends that have been built for it. One of them is Drupal, which is why we're talking here today. Uh, there is also a Rails front end called, was called Hydra, is now called Samvera. Um, and in fact, if you look up Fedora on the net, you'll find there's actually a whole bunch of different projects around the world all using it as a back end repository. Um, so Islandora, the key, the, the key components, are Drupal is the front end, so you do most of your administration through, the, through Drupal. You, the content goes into Fedora uh, and then is indexed into Solar. 
Uh, and this makes it pretty different to a standard Drupal site, and I'll talk about this in a moment, but it means that most of the content you're working with is not actually in Drupal. So we've got 153,000 objects or so in the Quake Studies archive. I think we have about three nodes, and those are the about pages. So it has very different characteristics compared to typical Drupal sites. Um, but Islandora is really interesting, and I think it has a bright future because it's kind of at the intersection of institutional repository, which is typically a tertiary education wanting, uh, sorry, tertiary education provider wanting to keep copies of all their theses and papers that are produced by faculty and students. And up until very recently, that was typically just PDFs, uh, preprint PDFs or maybe postprint. But Research looks very different now, and the outputs are often non-traditional. So the output of, say, a, a degree in modern dance might be videos and choreography and a whole bunch of studio notes and things like that, and maybe not a PDF in sight. So uh, some of the traditional solutions for institutional repositories are struggling because of the diversity of different file types and, and uh, metadata that needs to be kept. Uh, there's also digital collection management. So that's where you have digital objects, maybe photographs, maybe scans of diaries, et cetera, uh, that you want to showcase. And, and that's often museums and libraries, um, collecting institutions really want to make, uh, give this content the best possible presentation and preserve it over the long term. And increasingly, universities in particular, but um, Crown Research Institutes and so on, are looking for solutions for research data management. So we're awash in data, and it's often not well curated and not well maintained over time. And it's all about keeping track of it, understanding the provenance of it, um, versioning it, preserve it preser preserving it for the long term. So um, I'm going to show you a few examples of Island Drawer just so you get a sense of, of where they're at. So the first one here is, is kind of almost the home of um, Island Dora. So this is the Robertson Library at University of Prince Edward Island. This is just a quick snapshot of their search UI. Um, and it has an amazing amount of facets, so you can drill down uh, into the research on lots of different angles in, in terms of topics and so forth. So that's a classic case of institutional repository. Most of the content is PDFs. Uh, another example is Simon Fraser University, who have a uh, research data repository based on Islandora, and they've kind of built an own an in-house kind of Dropbox. So researchers can just drag and drop their files, and they'll get uh, allocated a DOI, so a document identifier, and they'll go into a repository where they can be held and versioned and uh, pulled out again later. Uh, Vancouver Public Library uh, have got a relatively recent Island Dora instance. It's got some nice features. This is their story city map. And if you drill down on the map, uh, unfortunately it's a bit uh, clipped, um, but you then have access to the interviews, for example, so you, it'll be telling the story of that part of the city. So this is very much for public-facing digital content where you're showcasing a particular collection. One of the most visually impressive ones is the May Bragdon Diaries. Um, this is really nicely themed. Uh, this is not one we've built, um, but it's just really beautiful presentation of a classic case of digital collection management really uh, brings the material to life. In this case, it's a, it's a set of uh, uh, diaries that have been transcribed and the viewing interface means you can see the original and you can see the text that's been marked up as, as TEI and You'll see that some of these underlines in the text, that's where they've identified specific people or places. So a lot of those have pop-ups, so you can find out more information that can link off. So I'm a big fan of this kind of thing. Not only are you making it accessible, but you're providing this great resource for future research and so on. Um, now, I'll do what they always say never to do, which is a live demo. Let's just see if I can pull that off, and we'll just see if this is going to work for us. So this is just a quick demo instance that we have got up and running when people ask about what Islandora can do. So typically you have a series of collections that are identified with a thumbnail that can be hierarchical, so you can have collections within collections, and eventually you get down to individual objects. And 
In some cases, that object is just a simple photograph, uh, along with some metadata about that photograph. But it can be almost any binary file with almost any metadata. And one of the things that Islandora is quite good at uh, is having some fairly modern viewing systems. So this is using the Mozilla PDF.js viewer. So this is a, a scan of a World War I uh, diary. And uh, you know these days you can do a lot just within the browser with JavaScript. So you can scroll around, around the pages. Um, we can download this as a PDF. You can zoom in and out, all that kind of thing, and just so you get a feel for what's under the hood. This is the data that's in the back end for this book, just one of the pages for that book. So uh, we have the, or the original object file that was read in. We have a bunch of derivative images, things like JPEGs and the thumbnail. We've got uh, OCR, so when you upload a PDF, it'll automatically try to extract the text, and if it's an image, it'll perform OCR on that. And you can see the OCR data stream, and then the HOCR, which is the OCR text located over the images. So you, when you do a copy and paste, you're picking up um, the text from that location. One of the other nice viewers is using uh, Open Sea Dragon, which is a tiling image viewer. So this is suitable for uh, high-res scans, so seriously high-res. We've got one example, not this one, that was a 750 meg TIFF file. Um, and it means you can zoom in. Um, so first we can make it full screen with any luck. Not sure if the data connection is that great. Uh, let's just go back to home, maybe. Yeah, I think I'm, I've lost the connection here. But the um, tiling image viewer, it's kind of like Google Maps, but for scanned documents. So you can zoom right in. It's really smooth and slick and it really showcases the high-res scans. You can drill right down and see all of the details of the manuscript or, or whatever it is. So just to, whoops, I'll just make that full screen again. So just to reiterate, uh, the nature of the uh, content within Fedora you have an object and it can have one, multiple data streams and those are typically divided up into your binary data, data streams which is typically the original object plus any derivatives that have come from that. So it might be a JPEG and then you might have a, a thumbnail of that. It could be a PDF with OCR, it could be uh, an MP4 that's really high res and then you have uh, a derivative through FFmpeg or something similar for the video that you showcase to people on the, on the web. Uh, all of that is striped to disk as XML, so all of the metadata is XML and all the binaries get stored on the disk. So even though uh, Fedora has a MySQL database, a traditional database, and it has a triple store, all of the data pretty much within those is created out of the XML. So this is where the digital preservation aspect comes in. The point is those are stable file formats that can be preserved long term. It's not reliant on a database that might get corrupted and suddenly you've lost your critical metadata. Uh, there are a lot of moving parts to the whole ensemble. Um, so I mentioned triple store. Uh, most Islandora by default ships with Mulgara triple store, but that hasn't actually been updated for about five years. So some places are swapping it out for BlazeGraph. And that means you can do some really interesting Sparkle queries and things like that uh, and traverse the graph and, and explore relationships between objects. There's G-Search, which is a Java component that indexes the content out of Fedora into Solar. And then later on, when you do a search through Drupal, you're querying Solar directly. But remember, Drupal doesn't have the nodes, so it's kind of doing some fancy tricks to request the data out of Solar and, and paint a search results page, but for content that isn't actually in Drupal. 
There's a Drupal filter, which is a Java component, and that's very handy. What it does is when you make a request to the Fedora API, it uses the Drupal filter to go and check the user permissions out of Drupal. So it's a way of looking up the roles and permissions within Drupal and applying that back on the Java side for the API. And that was one of the fundamental limitations with Quake Studies as it stood at the moment, was the Drupal filter wasn't around, which meant they couldn't actually make the API available to anybody who they couldn't trust to honor the, the permissions. There is some content in the repository that's restricted, um, and it's only available to certain researchers. And so that's really hampered their ability to publish the API. There's a whole bunch of helper systems. So there's uh, things like Tika uh, for PDFs, I think, uh, Tesseract OCR, um, LAME and FFmpeg for transcoding audio and video, uh, Jatoka, which is the tiling image server for the high-res images and so on. So there's some really, uh, you know, a lot of moving parts, a lot to maintain, a lot to wire up. It makes getting a repeatable build somewhat challenging, but we're, we're there at the moment. So, sorry, I've just been talking about that. Um, so, oh, let me just go back for a second and mention the metadata. So, by default, Drupal uh, Island Drawer will store your metadata in a schema called MODS, which has come out of the USA, I think, the Library of Congress. Uh, it's a reasonably heavy schema, and so I think it's a bit overkill for a lot of New Zealand situations. Uh, and so we chose to use RDF, and I'll talk about that a, a little bit in a moment. Um, also, the way that, because we've got Drupal, we've got modules, and the way that Islandora tends to work is it uses things called solution packs. So that's typically, a solution pack will be a module, or maybe a handful of modules, and between them, they will specify the metadata formats to be stored, the forms that you enter the metadata in, the, the binary, the, the MIME types that you expect to be handling, like PDF or, or MP3. Uh, the solution packs will often also come with one or more viewers. So it could be the PDF uh, viewer from Mozilla, or it could be some other plugin that you use to showcase that piece of content. And then typically, if you want PDF, you deploy the PDF solution pack and you get all of that functionality stood up for you. So um, why did Quake Studies want to move? Well, I've already mentioned that uh, the company that originally built it uh, went out of business, which is never great but they were using open c components. So they were on Drupal and they were on Fedora. The only thing was it was a one-off special Snowflake build that nobody else in the world was using. Uh, as well as that, there was some niggling bugs and because we weren't overly familiar with the system, we weren't the originators of it, you know, there were some things that would have been expensive to fix just because of the time taken to assure ourselves that we weren't going to break some other part of the system by changing something. Uh, there was also uh, that security issue I mentioned uh, where they couldn't really make the API available to other researchers or, or interested parties because of the security model. Uh, also, the design wasn't responsive, which you know is, is almost <laughs> fundamental these days. And there was also the opportunity to simplify the ontology. So what they ended up with was quite a complex ontology. I'm not sure if the colors are coming through terribly well, but the ones marked in red are uh, entities that we dropped in the migration. So they had quite an um, ambitious data model, and it turned out that once they actually got content, they didn't need some of the fields that they'd added and some of the entities that are, they'd added. So uh, between moving to a community-supported code base and simplifying the ontology, I think they're in a much more sustainable position for the long term. Uh, so just to quickly mention that, the main part at the top is literally a part. So they had collections, their definition of objects, and then parts. So objects were a kind of a container, but all of the files were in things called parts. So if you had a book, that might be the object, and then all of the pages of the book would be a part. And it was a kind of an awkward structure. Uh, and then surrounding that were a lot of kind of what I call helping entities. So it was people and place and license and event and things like that. So those were kind of, are all kind of peripheral to the objects, but they provide context. So one of the first things we had to do as part of this migration was do some discovery on what 
content they had, what were the different MIME types, all that kind of stuff. So we, we did a lot of poking around. We also had to decide what we're going to move to. Are we going to move to mods? Are we going to move to Dublin Core? Are we going to move to, to something else? Um, so we started investigating that, and it occurred to me that if we could figure out a way to use the Drupal migration uh, framework, then that would be a win, because we're familiar with that. I just come off the Otago Daily Times uh, migration, so we've just been doing a lot of work with Migrate Module. But remember, Migrate is typically designed for migrating content into Drupal from somewhere else. And in this case, we are not targeting Drupal nodes. Um, so one of the first things we did was to create some quick content types that mirrored that ontology that I showed you. We just quickly whipped up some content types with a whole bunch of fields, and you know that Drupal does that really well. We just yanked in a whole bunch of data by reading the XML from the Fedora API, and then viewed it in tables that we could export as CSV. And once we could export it as CSV, we could chuck it into tools like OpenRefine and do text faceting on that. And that helped us understand the nature of the material that we we're dealing with, what summarize all of the fields in, in the open refined columns. And it helped us find things like all the off by you know, all the interesting spellings of things like suburbs. So you'd often have things like St. Albans spelt with S T or spelled out as Saint, and sometimes with a full stop. And often with a and, and some of these names also had trailing spaces that were invisible in the UI but of course would show up as soon as you're trying to do any data matching. So by pulling the data into OpenRefine, um, which if you're not familiar with it, it's a tool. It was originally by Gridworks. It was purchased by Google. For a little while it was Google Refine, then Google made it open as OpenRefine. And I totally recommend checking it out if you have any data cleaning you need to do. So that gave us a bit of a picture of where we stood. We also ended up doing a bunch of Spark UL queries on the research uh, index on, on um, Fedora directly, and so we could do Sparkle queries to pull out the content that we're looking for. Uh, and we generated a new ontology. So originally I was targeting just Dublin Core because that's nice and simple and lowest common denominator, but it wasn't quite rich enough to capture all of the data that we wanted. So we ended up moving to RDF, which I'm personally quite happy about. I think it's the right call. And that meant it was mostly Dublin Core, but with a sprinkling of a few other fields from other ontologies. So instead of DC coverage, we went to Dublin Core Terms Spatial and Dublin Core Terms Event, uh, sorry, Temporal, uh, which you can see over here. We've got Spatial, so wherever we've got a, a grid location for a photograph, we can put it into Dublin Core Spatial, uh, Dublin Core Terms Spatial. That gets indexed in Solar using Solar's spatial indexing which means we can eventually do some cool proximity searching and things like that. So if somebody's looking at the corpus and they're looking at a building, they can say, well, what else was around this, this location? Um, what we did is migrate through Drupal back into Fedora. So we did that by subclassing. Oh, sorry, I'll move on to the next thing. Oh, just quickly before I move off the ontology, there's a couple of other things in there. One is down the bottom, you might see Digital New Zealand landing page. So Digital New Zealand is the um, federated uh, metadata search across about 300 or so collecting institutions across New Zealand. And they have some of their own fields that they like to collect as well as Dublin Core. So we could create some fields specifically to keep them happy. Uh, and also where we couldn't find an external vocabulary with the information that we wanted, we could coin our own fields. So that's where the, the QSR creator party comes in. And that was basically just to preserve some old data that was entered in a kind of free text way that meant it wasn't a good fit for other fields. Uh, so then to migrate, we subclassed the um, migrate destination object to make it a destination Fedora object. And that meant we could get all of the power of Drupal's migrate framework, including the ability to roll forward and back and to migrate by individual ID. But when it came to actually generate the content, instead of generating a node, it's talking to Fedora and creating an object in, in Fedora. Um, and then we basically had some logic in there to say, okay, what kind of file am I working with? Um, if, I'm, if I've got a PDF, then I'll go generate a PDF content model on Fedora. And if I've got a JPEG, I'll go build a basic image content model, etc. Um, so you can have a look at this when the slides are online, but basically, 
this is the subclass of the uh, migration object, and the beauty is you only need to subclass a couple of fields, uh, a couple of uh, methods. So basically, uh, in the middle there is um, import and uh, rollback, basically. There's not a whole lot else. There's a couple of kind of declarative things to make sure it hooks into the migrate framework. But basically, as long as you can add and delete, because if you can't delete, you can't roll back, um, then there's the potential to use the whole migrate framework to migrate into just about anything, which I think is pretty neat. Uh, but of course, when I went looking, I could hardly find any examples of people migrating through Drupal to anything else. Um, this is what Drush looks like on the command line for the migration status. Shows you a whole bunch of migrations, uh, one of which is importing at the moment. The, the ones highlighted in blue are the ones targeting the content models in Fedora. So the ones that aren't highlighted are the ones where we targeted nodes just for that discovery phase. Um, and as of a couple of hours ago, we were at 44%, I think. So we have about 1.3 terabytes worth of data to shift, and it's not just a straight file copy. So the PDFs are all being re-ingested and re-OCR'd, and the videos are all being retranscoded and all that kind of thing. So that's why it's a very time-consuming process. But with a command line, we can give it a whole bunch of IDs to process and, and then check it you know, three or four hours down the track. Uh, the order of migration is obviously quite important. You've got to start with the stuff that has no dependencies, so in this case licenses, which only had a few fields, and then gradually bring in um, the places and the events, uh, the parties, which was we broke into, into people and organizations, um, categories, then collections, and then finally objects, because those objects might have references to all of those other entities and their parent collection. Um, we're keeping track of it with, um, this is a wee d3.js uh, visualization of a tree because we have a hierarchical arrangement for all of the collections. Um, so we generated some reports that tell us um, how the collections are related, how many objects are within each collection, um, and what kind of MIME types within, within those collections. So some of the challenges uh, and some of the things we ran into. Uh, Kind of naively, we could just yank the XML out of um, the Fedora API and process it and we'd be good, but very soon after trying that, the whole thing fell over, and it turned out there was an object in there that had 83 megabytes of, of metadata in its XML, and that was, we weren't using a streaming XML parser, so the whole thing, that was enough to choke PHP XML DOM. Um, so we had to rework the, the XML. So the beauty is there's enough flexibility in the Drupal Migrate framework that we could just pull out the pieces of XML that we wanted and basically synthesize a much simpler XML of just the latest version of the object. So we haven't tried to preserve some of the edits to the metadata, just the latest copy. Um, and that, that 83 megabytes was a side effect of, of some brokenness in the old system. Basically every time, um, every time an object got added to a collection, the collection metadata got a new version. And because a particular collection had a whole lot of content added over time, the XML just blew out. Um, also, when what we're doing is at the moment, the um, we've got a staging environment in the Catalyst Cloud, but the UAT environment and the production environment are on University of Canterbury infrastructure. And when we first started migrating, we found that we were getting these random DNS timeouts, uh, which wasn't expected. Um, so luckily, it was a relatively simple workaround to hard code the IP addresses of the servers. But you know, who would have thought? So always be prepared for the unexpected when it comes to migrating. Uh, like I said, 1.3 terabytes, a lot of data, uh, and all the transcoding. Order of migration, we've been through that. One of the Little things again using Drupal Migrate was um, ID list expansions. So where you can specify which object or which collection you want to migrate, but it's just moving that one that you specify. But one of the things that we did was if we provided the identifier for the parent object, it could go off and get all of the IDs. So if we were migrating an object, we could potentially give it a collection ID and it would come back with all of the object IDs for that collection. And it's just a wee shortcut, which is quite nice. 
Um, and one thing that we're kind of thinking about, we haven't tried in anger, but we hope to very soon, is multiplexing the migration. So basically just subclassing the part migration into multiple parts because, for example, video migration can often take you know half an hour to transcode an individual video. And at the moment, you can only migrate you know, one part at a time. So the next thing to do is, is to just subclass that and see if we can push a whole lot more through. Um, so this is just a glimpse of the, the new Quake studies. So it's now a responsive design built on Twitter Bootstrap. Um, you know, the, the collections are way more kind of prominent, um, less kind of boilerplate and nav, and really trying to let the content shine through. Uh, so what's the future for Quake studies now that they're Sorry, I'll go back for, for the photo. Done, thank you. Um, so there's a you know a whole whole backlog of, of potential enhancements that can be looked at once this migration is complete. Uh, one of the first ones that everybody wants to see is maps. I mean, it's a highly location focused collection, and the obvious way to look at it is through maps and potentially being able to do things like kind of walk down a street effectively uh, navigationally so that when you see a building you can see what was on either side of that address wise. Uh, one of the other things we've done just as an experiment but we'll productionize it in due course was a lookup of the LINS, that's Land Information New Zealand street map, uh, sorry street address database. They've got 1.9 million New Zealand street addresses and it's all public open data uh, and we've got an autocomplete against that data set. So to put that into production I want to keep that 1.9 million rows in our local database so you're not round tripping all the way to LINS for that information but it already works and if you choose a street address out of that autocomplete it then does a second request back to the LINS data service and it will get the lat long and all of the locality information. Uh, obviously improved displays for contents, now we've got um, JavaScript based PDF viewers, uh, more modern um, video viewers, that kind of stuff. Uh, and now they're on a community based platform, so they're already benefiting or about to benefit from that fact. So while we just kicked off the migration a few weeks ago, uh, Islandora version 7.x, 1.10, oh it should be 1.10 there, sorry, um, just got released. So that comes with a whole bunch of bug fixes and a few enhancements. So uh, we won't interrupt the migration to do that update, but as soon as the migration is done, we can bring them up to date. And so they're already benefiting from being part of a wider community of a few hundred, a few hundred other institutions. Um, and they can make the API available. So we've always uh, batted around the idea of doing some kind of hack fest or something where people could come and build apps and visualizations using these data sets, um, using this corpus. And that wasn't really possible when the API wasn't fully locked down. But now, we, once we're confident that we've got it right, um, there's a possibility to do a whole lot of interesting stuff through the API. And just to wrap up um, a little bit about the future of Islandora, so right now, Islandora is based on Drupal 7. Um, there is a Drupal 8 project in the works, and there's already Fedora Commons 4. And between them, they implement a lot of interesting stuff. So they're going full noise with RDF as the kind of uber metadata standard for everything. Uh, it will be a instance of a W3C linked data container. So it's all about the URLs, it's all about uh, the graph, uh, semantic web, that kind of stuff. They're also moving to the Portland Common Data Model, so that's basically an agreement between the Ruby on Rails um, front ends and the Drupal front ends to agree on a common data model for things like collections and objects. Uh, it's really heavily, so there's already some microservices in the current Islandora, but they're again doubling down on a microservice architecture. So all of the transcoding, OCR, derivative gen generation, all of that is a microservice that you call and get a, a response back from. And with that is another um, almost meta API called API X. So that's basically how in a microservice environment you can register your solution pack and basically insert in that pipeline your own microservices to do other pieces of work. So it might be um, shelling off to FFmpeg or it might be reaching out to an uh, identity provider to uh, come back with an identifier for this new asset, all that kind of stuff. 
uh, you know, the future is, is really exciting there because it's going to be so powerful and so flexible when it comes to maintaining different kinds of, of data sets and their metadata over the long term. So that's pretty much all I had to say. Has anybody got any questions? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, did we run into any issues with circular references? Not so far, because we're 44% of the way through. Um, we did come, we, we, the migration did fall over momentarily when we found some references to objects that no longer existed, um, which is unusual, so there's some referential integrity issues there. Um, nothing major, really, just a few. Um, but yeah, so far, we'll, we'll see what happens. But at the moment, we haven't, haven't detected that. Any other questions? Oh, sorry, I can't see you because of the light, but yeah, go ahead. I'm just trying to get to understand the, the Fedora, and so is that just the data storage end, and you use the island Dora as the interface to put everything in and grab everything? Exactly, exactly. So I, uh, Fedora has a relatively simple REST API where you're basically putting content in and taking it out again. Um, well, typically not taking it out because it's for preservation, but uh, you can put the data in and query it, and there's, there's a few different ways to, to do that, but primarily it's kind of like a headless content store, and all of the administration and all of the configuration, all of the user accounts, all that kind of stuff is all within Drupal. Yeah, Donna. Uh, at the moment, you would go through the kind of uh, object creation forms within Islandora. So it would be you're, you're working with a Drupal form. Mm -hmm. It's just when you hit and, and you'd fill out your metadata, mm -hmm. and then you go to it basically gives you a wizard. So then after that, you go to an upload yep. uh, form, and that's where you'd upload your video. Mm -hmm. And then when you hit in, ingest, then it pushes it into the back end and runs all the transcoding and all that kind of stuff. So it does, it does the yeah. Yeah. So, it, you know, depending on the content that you're putting in, there'll be a series of services that it expects to run, and that might be transcoding the video, it might be OCRing the PDF, but all of that kind of happens behind the scenes. And is it using to do yes, it is. Oh. Yeah. And if you're up, if you're uploading a, an object, regardless of what it is, do you have to um, determine what that object is before you upload it and choose the right form, or will it figure it out for you based on the form? So the question is, when you're uploading an object, will it figure out what kind of content you're targeting? Um, we've kind of sidestepped that by providing the same object form for all of the kinds of objects that Quake Studies is keeping. Uh -huh. So in theory, you can have different kinds of objects with different forms, keeping different kinds of metadata with them. And you can multiplex forms with objects. So you could have multiple forms targeting the same object or you could have individual forms targeting completely different ones. So you could put in, you could have a form that just is a title. I mean, it's not overly useful, but you could. Uh, or you could have a form that's got, you know, tens if not hundreds of fields, mm -hmm. depending on what you need. And, and I know some of the other institutions using Islandora uh, storing bioinformatics data sets, you know, in a science context. So there's potentially hundreds and hundreds of fields. You know, you can store the whole configuration for some of your instruments along with the data set that was generated with that configuration. So that way you're kind of archiving your whole research oh, workflow. Nice. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah I was just wondering um, about the use of Apache Sol for researching and using that as the primary way to, to query the, um, the Fedora database. Or does, that, does Fedora provide its own APIs for, for the queries that you find Solar is faster? Or Okay, so the question is kind of what the role of Solar is relative to Fedora's search. So, yes, from Drupal's point of view, the primary search UI is Solar. Uh, and Solar, you know, it's, it's a very powerful search engine. You can do a lot with it. Uh, but it's mainly for searching the text content where that's available, which, you know, for an image, for example, it might not be. But there's nothing stopping you putting more data into that Solar, you know, pushing more metadata into Solar with each object. So. That way you can facet by collection or by license and all that kind of thing. 
but there is also a SparkQL search as well, which typically isn't made publicly available, but in due course it could be. So that's where you can query the graph and, and do some really uh, cool queries using the you know, the graph structure to traverse down collections or find objects that are related to this entity that also are related to some other entity. Uh, so that you can do some really powerful stuff, which is what we have been doing just to make sure we are covering the collection. All right, might have time for one or two. Oh, sorry, up the back. Yes, yeah, you still use, so Drupal will play a role the whole time. It's, it's you know, because Drupal is so flexible with the theming and all that kind of stuff, that's why Islandora is, is attractive to people. So not only does, do you have quite a good administrative experience through Drupal with all of the forms and things, but you can also theme it and customize the way it looks and you can put responsive, you know, designs on there and so forth. Yeah, sorry, I didn't repeat the question, but the question was, uh, you know, what is the role of Drupal once the migration is over? Was there one more? Okay, so the first question is, uh, what does Fedora do about ver versioning? Yes, it does version everything. So uh, by default, if I make an edit to the metadata or upload a different binary, it will version that. Uh, the second question was, sorry? Do you guys consider any other backend stores? Of, like, instead of using Fedora, you use a, maybe a as a... No. Repository? Short, okay, so the question was, did we consider any other storage other than Fedora? Um, short answer, no. I mean, the university are very happy with Fedora. Um, all the research I've done indicates it's getting increased uptake around the world, especially in North America. There's a lot of investment in it, and I think it's you know, it's been around since 1997, so it's a robust, known solution that's increasingly API-driven, well, almost completely API-driven, so it's a good fit for a variety of contexts um, as part of some kind of digital preservation environment. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Um, yeah, thanks for joining me at Drupal South and let's enjoy the party. Cheers.